In this video, we will be talking about atomic structure and bonding. For the structure of an atom, we have a nucleus at the center, which contains protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which have a neutral charge, which is surrounded by electrons, which are negatively charged in the electron cloud. So how these electrons are arranged in the atom depends on quantum mechanics, which states that electrons exist in orbitals in the electron cloud that are also in shells. So for the first shell, we have the s atomic orbital, in the second shell, we have the s and p atomic orbitals. In the third and fourth shell, we have d and also f atomic orbitals. For organic chemistry, we will be mostly focusing on the first and second shell. So there are three rules that exist. The first rule, the Pauli exclusion principle, states that only two electrons at a given time can exist in an orbital, and each electron must have opposite spin and cannot have the same spin in the same orbital. The off-ball principle states that electrons always go to the lowest energy orbital first. Hund's rule states that when there are two or more atomic orbitals with the same energy, an electron will occupy an empty orbital before it will pair up with another electron. So for the s orbital, we have one, so we have, we have two electrons we can fill. For p, we have three orbitals. For d, there is five. And for f, there is seven. So if we look at a periodic table, we have the s block existing in the first two columns. We have the p block existing here, the d block with the transition metals, and the F block with the bottom two rows here. So we will be primarily looking at the S and P block only. So for example, let's do carbon. Carbon is going to exist here. So we're going to have S and P orbitals that exist, and we know that carbon is going to have six electrons that we will have to assign. So, when we're looking at carbon, we have six electrons. If we go from top left, and we go from left to right, we have the first row, we have the S, will get filled. Then if we go in the second row, we have an S orbital, and then if we go on the right side of the second row, we also have p orbitals that can be filled as well. Now we can either do two in the s, and then one p here, one p here, and then nothing in this orbital, or we can do one here, one here, one here, and one here. The four orbitals half filled because that will be more stable than having this filled and not having that third orbital empty. However, when we form bonds with carbon, such as H's, and we make methane, we get something known as hybridization, which is actually a combination of the S and P character. So we actually get entirely different orbitals with entirely different shapes and energy. So for the hybridization, we have sigma and pi bonds. So for sigma bonds, the electrons are going to exist between the nuclei. And for pi bonds, they're going to exist above and below. So for sigma bonds, those are going to be your single bonds. And for pi bonds, is going to be your double and triple bonds. 
And so your double bond is going to have one pi, and then your triple bond is going to have two pi bonds, and then you always have a sigma bond. That's going to be your skeletal structure for your bonds. So for sp3, the shape is going to be tetrahedral, which is going to have 25% s character and 75% p character. So for sp2, the shape is going to be trigonal planar. It's going to have a little bit more s character, a little less p character. For sp, the shape is going to be linear, and we're going to have a 50-50 character between S and P. So for tetrahedral, you get about 109.5 degree difference between your bonds. For SP2, you get 120, and for linear, you get 180. So now that we understand hybridization, in quantum mechanics, we can look at electronegativity between different atoms. So there are ionic and covalent bonds. So with ionic bonds, we have two atoms come together and they transfer electrons to form a bond. With covalent bonds, they're going to share electrons to form a bond. So with a covalent bond, we're going to have two atoms come together with similar electronegativity, and with ionic, there's going to be different electronegativity. So which is more ionic, HCl or methane? Well, if you look at HCl, we have 2.1 and 3, or we have 2.1 and 2.5. So the greater electronegativity difference is going to be HCl, so it's more ionic. Now we look at HF or HCl, both are bonding with H, and then we have F and Cl, and so F is more electronegative. What you also get is these things called dipoles, which is opposite partial charges. And so how we represent this is with a delta plus and a delta minus. So this chlorine is withdrawing, is pulling electrons from this hydrogen very slightly because of its electronegativity. And so you might ask which electrons participate in bonding? Well we have core electrons which are the inner shells that do not participate in forming bonds, and for valence electrons, they are going to exist in the outer shell, and they do participate in bonding. So now we have a grasp on electronegativity and hybridization, we can look at Lewis structures. Lewis states that with the octet rule, an atom is most stable if its outer shell is either filled or contains eight electrons. So this is where these atoms are kind of mimicking the noble gases where their octet are filled. That's why they are inert gases. So if we have the Lewis structure of table salt, we have sodium, and we can have it have one valence electron. Then we have chlorine, which is going to have seven valence electrons. And what's going to happen is those two electrons are going to form a bond. And so this is a stable structure. If we look at a different structure, if we look at formic acid, which has a structure H2CO2, we have H has one electron, one valence electron. And we have carbon with two oxygens. 
Now we can choose to put carbon in the center. And let's say we put the oxygens between the H's here. And then let's draw our bonds. Well, this really wouldn't be a stable structure because our carbon only has four electrons to it. So which means we can't do two single bonds to it. So the appropriate structure is a double bond with an oxygen. And that way carbon has eight electrons. Hydrogen is satisfied. Oxygen is also satisfied according to the octet rule. If we have nitrogen, because this is nitrogen gas since it is diatomic, we have a nitrogen and we have a nitrogen. So for the valence electrons, it's going to exist like this. And so what happens is you actually get a triple bond between the two nitrogens, which satisfies the octet rule. So with Lewis structures, there also exists something as formal charge. And that's the number of valence electrons, which you can find on the periodic table. And you have the number of bonds minus the number of free electrons associated with each atom. So we have a hydronium ion. And so if we draw the structure, this is the hydronium ion. And if we look at this oxygen here, we know that oxygen is supposed to have six valence electrons. We minus the number of bonds to it. So it's going to be minus three bonds. And we minus two electrons because they are existing as lone pairs. And so that comes out of plus one. So oxygen in a hydronium ion has a formal charge of plus one. Now, when we look at number of bonds an atom should have, with hydrogen, it can have one bond. With carbon, we are going to give it four bonds. With nitrogen, three bonds. For oxygen, two bonds. And for a halogen, we also give it one bond. These are going to be very, very common atoms that we use throughout all of organic chemistry. And these are general rules of how many bonds each atom gets.